you're here, uh, here in this celebration. Uh, we have put together an amazing panel with all of these different perspectives uh, on the life and legacy of Joseph Plummerfeld. I think you're in for um, uh, maybe some uh, uh, stories maybe you have not heard before, and many of you will know the stories and you can tell them as we go along. But um, I, I want to start by saying that this is part of uh, a residency program that we have be begun in Joe's name. And um, this is um, Dr. Andre Thomas, who is with us, uh, and uh, Dr. Anton Armstrong. And they are our first guests for the residency. And uh, they've been working for the last two days and will continue to work tomorrow as part of the Kemp Symposium because they are also Kemp children. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so they- We were the kids with the tan, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so they will continue to work. Um, so I'm, I, I'm, um, I'm sorry that, uh, I know that some of you were able to attend Joe's memorial service. It was in, at St. Paul's in Indianapolis back in uh, May. And uh, it was the most unbelievable thing, uh, outpouring of love and music. And Joe planned every part of the service. So it was perfect, Joe Flummer felt down to the T. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna start tonight, and I'm gonna t I just wanna start by talking to you about this room. Um, so this room, uh, uh, many of you, I, I see lots of, uh, most of you are alums and know, you'll know how incredibly special this hideous room is. <laughs> <laughs> it actually looks a whole lot better today so than it did. Yeah. Um, when, I, when, I, when I came uh, uh, to this room, uh, there were 257 people in symphonic choir, and we rehearsed. The stage didn't come out this far, and we had these folding chairs, and uh, they, they were setting up the room for the first day, and they set up the piano over here where Joe always rehearsed, where oftentimes he sat on the piano which just appalled me, it still to this day appalls me, but that, that, that was him. So I actually uh, ha had the, we turned the room around and a lot of that was because I was just so in awe. I mean, there was, I, I didn't want to do things like Joe because there's no way that I could have stood in his shoes. I, I just couldn't do that. I needed to be my own person and, and do it that way. So I at least just turned the room around. <laughs> but I want you to think about this for a moment. So uh, even though Williamson rehearsed in, the, in this space, it, the Bristol Chapel was really that space where the choir college began in those rehearsals. And then this became Joe's era, you know, when he was here. And all of the people that have walked through this room, but he still lives in this room. Uh, and now today, the next chapter with uh, Hillman Hall and how that has kind of transformed. So space does mean something, and this space is deeply meaningful. And I still feel Joe when, when, when I'm in this space. Um, just like I feel Lindsay Christensen, you know, she's here talking to us all the time. Joe's in this room talking to us all the time. And Nancy Wicklund uh, also. So to the, these incredible pillars of people uh, that, are, that are still living and, and, and haunting this space. Marjorie Klein uh, is here tonight, and I just want to acknowledge her from the beginning because uh, the way that, that Joe kept up with so many things is because Marjorie was his personal secretary. <laughs> and uh, so I always knew how to communicate. And so um, she was very important and integral to what was happening. Um, at the memorial service, um, um, Dan Pratt spoke and Nancy Ann Perella spoke. And Andrew McGill and Scott Detra uh, gave us uh, a wonderful conducting and uh, um, the Hughleys, uh, the, many of you know them, they were instrumental in making sure that all of that service went together. But I, uh, I, I just, I, I want us tonight to just be mindful because many of you that weren't there, tonight we'll, we'll celebrate uh, this incredible, incredible man. I wanna start and just tell you, um, uh, um, um, before I introduce the panel, um, I, wanna in, I just wanna tell you how I kn knew Joe Flummerfeld. This, this actually, I'll, I'll just start, everyone, this is Laura Brooks Rice here on the end uh, that, that is here. And um, Laura was a professor here uh, at, at Westminster, uh, kind of a pillar of our voice program, who's now, now retired. And uh, so Laura brings this perspective of being with Joe. Not, uh, she sang with him as a professional singer, as a soloist, you, you know, being with him, but also as his colleague here at Westminster Choir College. 
And this is Dr. Anton Armstrong, who I've introduced already. And um, Anton's relationship with Joe is one more from the outside as a professional growing up with him. And they have a, a deep and long, over 30 year relationship. So he brings a different perspective. And this is Heather Buchanan. Heather's <laughs> now professor of music and director of choral activities at Montclair State University. And she comes from this as a, from a student perspective and then as a colleague and in many other roles. So uh, we, uh, I'm so delighted that we have these different perspectives. But I'll start tonight and just talk a little about my perspective, which is very different from theirs because I didn't work with Joe in the same capacity. Joe was much more my friend. When I came to Westminster, he, um, he was just so gracious to me. He showed up at my house, my husband Tim and I, and he showed up at our house immediately, first when we arrived, and said, let's go have dinner. And we went and had dinner at Casey Prime. It was one of his favorite places to eat. And you're going to hear lots of food stories tonight. <laughs> we all have them. But um, uh, my relationship with Joe was always someone standing behind me, really helping. But m mainly, he also knew to stay out of the way. He knew I had to fight my own battles. I had to forge my own way. And he just helped me to do that in the most beautiful way. And I was so lucky because he continued on at the Spoleto Festival, where I got to work with him very, very much. I can remember um, the very first time that I met Joe, uh, actually was his tenor soloist for a Lord Nelson Mass that we were doing. And uh, Pearl Shankwan, one of his wonderful, wonderful students, had put together this huge festival as part of ACDA and invited three of our college choirs to come together so Joe could conduct. And then they, uh, they hired uh, 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 some soloists and they hired me to do that. So um, I, um, but I came in for the first rehearsal and he, Joe came into our rehearsal room in Kalamazoo and I was petrified because I'd heard of this man and I, was, uh, I didn't know what to expect and my choir was prepared. <laughs> <laughs> we could stand on our head and sing back, but I said, oh, well, I have no idea what is about to happen. And then he walked in, this huge, amazing presence, and he began, and, he, and yes, he was wearing his burgundy turtleneck. <laughs> and he walked in and then he began to work and it was just so beautiful. My students just melted in his hands, and it was absolutely a love fest from the, from the very beginning. But there was something very interesting about it. I was going, the way he worked, I was like, I know who you are. I, I mean, it wasn't just his presence. It was like, no, I really know who you are. Uh, I've been trained so similar to how you think. And then uh, afterwards, I began to talk to him, and I said, um, I just feel like, and, and he said the same thing. He said. Your choir is prepared so deeply, and you know he was being very complimentary. I said, but it, it's different than that. I said, how do you, how, why? And I was asking questions about how he thought about a certain things. And I said, you were at Illinois, and I said, uh, he said yes. And um, I said, well, my teacher was Elmer Thomas, and he said yes. We were office mates at in, in college. So they grew up together, and so by me coming from this Illinois path through my teacher, Elmer Thomas, and then I was meeting Joe, it was like, oh. I mean, I just felt really at home. And then I went on to prepare several things for Joe at Spoleto for several years, prepared for him, and that was always just easy because I knew pretty much exactly what he <laughs> wanted. And, uh, and, that, that was, uh, and that was wonderful, and I just will never forget those years. They were wonderful years. And uh, I, I, Joe really wanted, uh, he, was, he, wanted he, he knew that I was growing and he wanted to step aside. And I said, not yet, not yet, don't go yet. Stay, stay a little longer. And he did. And he stayed on at Spleto a couple of years longer. And I just cherish all of that moment. But most of my times, um, and Tim and I, most of our time w with Joe were spent drinking and eating <laughs> and laughing. <laughs> Uh, because I didn't have any of the pressures of many of the, uh, the, the different things that, that the rest of this panel did. It was just, uh, it was just, uh, just a, a friend, and uh, I, it grew to be a really deep friendship. 
one of the most wonderful things, uh, evenings of my life was having my teacher, Elmer Thomas, and Joe both to the house for dinner. And oh, if I just would have had a video camera. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely amazing. They were both Shawites, and uh, so that was, that was very interesting. I, I don't think I said a word the whole night. <laughs> I just stood back, except when I would prompt, prompt or, or, or you know, try, to, try to get them to uh, um, uh, you know, continue to tell, uh, to tell a long story. But, um, um, I, um, yeah, I, I, I miss him. Uh, so I thought we'd start tonight, and I'll uh, turn the floor over to Anton and let him start and uh, tell us uh, a few stories and uh, what his yeah. memories of Joe are. Uh, well, the first memory really was uh, I had a, at University of Illinois where Dr. Thomas and I met many years ago, uh, one of my master's uh, colleagues was David Lockhart, who was a music educator for many years in South Jersey. And he had been in the Westminster Choir, and, I, at, and he adored Joe. So that's how I first saw Joe. But he also, like many people, was scared of Joe. And <laughs> there was this reverence. And our first year, uh, our second year at Illinois in the fall, uh, the Westminster Choir came through Southern Illinois, and our, our mentor, Harold Decker, who had been Joe's teacher, said, you're all going. So I don't, you remember this concert. I, I still have the program. I collect everything. <laughs> But it was an evening of romantic, a, rom a romantic evening with the Westminster Choir. And most of the, it was all 19th century. I said, well, how boring can this be? Well, <laughs> first of all, we got there. Decker wanted us to get there in time to hear the warm up. And we got in there, and they were up on the stage, and things started coming apart a little bit. And he just stomped his foot, and he said, Frauke, get up here and fix them. <laughs> and out comes Frauke Hausman, and she comes up to the stage, and she does this. <laughs> She does her thing, and then she turns around. They're fixed. Don't mess them up again. <laughs> and they went down. She didn't say mess it up either. <laughs> <laughs> there were people in the audience. She was good. She was a good behavior, Laura. But we got there. And, that, and, and what I remember about that concert, uh, maybe Andre, you remember this as well, is incredible music. But they got to the end of this program, and they came out and did two encores. And the first encore, the Wilhowski battle hymn. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. lifted the roof off the place. <laughs> it was a, my God, almighty. And it was gorgeous. And then he came out, and then he did his Danny Boy. Mm -hmm. And this choir went from that symphonic choir to the best leader choir in the world. And he just, his hands went like that. And I still remember at one point. And at one point, he wanted, and they just came. And I remember at the very end, it's like he cradled the sound. That's my first inkling of hearing. And still I'll say all the albums I have of his, and I have a, nearly 10 of them, I think, it's that British and American folk song album that's still my favorite. I play it for my class every year in my advanced conducting class. But getting to know him was a different thing. And again, it's dear Lindsay Christensen over a meal. So for many years, I, as a boy, I sang the American Boy Choir. And I worked their summer program for 23 years and ran it for 13 years. And I had the joy of having both of Lindsay's children, Molly and Andreas, in the program. And she was, I didn't kind of know who Lindsay was. I, she was just one of the nice Princeton mothers. There were some terrorizing <laughs> Princeton mothers. But she was one of the nice Princeton mothers. And then eventually found out, she said, did you go to the University of Illinois? Well, she had gone to Illinois, too, and had worked. Her teacher, Grace Wilson, had been uh, my teacher's teacher at one point, it was all too intertwined at one point, but she said, well, you, you know Joe Thornfield? Well, I said, I know who he is. Oh, you need to know him. He needs to know you. I said, uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> you're coming to my house. I said, oh, that's not. You're coming to my house. And you know, if Lindsay said, you're coming, you didn't mess with her. You showed up. So I get to the house, and I get there before Joe and the kids, her husband taking the kids someplace. She says, it's just going to be you and Joe and me. So I'm finished. I was in the kitchen. She said, go out of the kitchen. I don't like people watching me cook. He'll be here in a few minutes. So the door opens, and he comes in. He kind of looks at me. He goes, all right. And we sit there kind of silently, just staring at each other. And, I'm, and finally, Lizzie comes up. Will the two of you talk to each other? Will you say, well, talk about Harold Decker. Talk about it. Just talk. And he scared me, because I had heard these stories. And, 
And many of us, one of the things they said to Lindsay at one point, well, I, he's kind of aloof. He says, he's actually a very shy man. And sometimes that's a defense mechanism. Well, over that evening, with dear Lindsay being kind of the, the hostess with Moses, it broke the ice between the two of us. We ended up having a delightful evening, and I don't think I had yet gone to St. Olaf. I was still at Calvin College. And then later we ended up having several times to um, uh, adjudicate together with some of the heritage festivals. We did one in Chicago with a, a friend and a colleague that will not be named at this point, otherwise I really will get in trouble. But this colleague took a rather unorthodox interpretation of a Brahms quartet. Uh -oh. Now you know how Joe felt about Brahms and everything. <laughs> and when that colleague finished, we were at Elmhurst College in Illinois, he was fuming. He, he was like, I was going like, so he says, what do you think about that? I said, I'm staying out of this one. <laughs> Kali came up, and they'd been longtime friends. And what the hell were you doing? <laughs> and, and, and still, and I'm like, just quiet. Anton, what do you think? You tell me what you think. Joe tells you, tell you what you think. You, and I said, well, to the Kali, I agree. It was rather unorthodox. And, but I saw the two of them just go at it all evening over dinner, the, the bringing scores. But at the end, I saw this huge hug that Joe gave to this colleague. But my two, I think the two times that I, and Joe Miller has, has also accorded us this graciousness, is in 2000, we were on tour with the St. Wolf Choir, singing at Carnegie Hall, and he said, well, come through Prince. We were singing Prince, and he said, come and let's share a rehearsal together. And we shared a rehearsal with the symphonic choir. And then at one point, the Westminster Choir and the Single Choir both had the promise of living in our repertoire. So there was my one student pianist and Nancy Ann Perella on the piano and Joe conducting. And Joe, I can still see those hands and the lines going through that. And then two years later, the Divi Eastern Division ACDA asked us, they knew we were coming back through Pennsylvania around the time of their conference. Would we share a concert together? Sure. You're not paying, are you? He said, no, we don't pay. <laughs> I had to convince my manager to give up a night of income. But when I said who it was, he said, yes, we can do this. And at one point in the Eastern Division newsletter, it was the battle of the choirs. And with, I guess, maybe the same half an hour, both Joe and I were on the phone. If you do that, we are out of this. But they said, well, can you do something together? So Joe and I are on the line. And I said, Joe, I have an idea. Because we were trying to say, and we really didn't have too much in, in line. That concert was superb. I remember when you were working today, it was a tour de force performance of Frida Alfeda, the Schoenberg. It was stunning. But I said, Joe, if they're expecting this, but let's, 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 let's try something different. Have you ever conducted the Chris Johnston Beautiful Savior, which is the Salem of Choir's signature piece? If I don't do it, I get fired, OK? <laughs> and at that point, he had kind of replaced the Lutkin benediction with his Danny Boy as his signature piece. So I said, well, why don't you conduct Beautiful Savior? and I'll conduct Danny Boy. Hmm. And we got there, and we were rehearsing, and when the Westminster Choir came in, and there was a sort of, the students were kind of looking at each other, and Joe just came on the stage and gave me the biggest bear hug. And from then, it was like two families, two lost cousins who had come back together. <laughs> and if you know the history of those two choirs, this is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Westminster Choir. It's also the 100th anniversary of the first tour that brought the St. Wolf Choir to the East. And Finley Williamson heard that choir on the way out. He stalked them for a while. And two years later, he, he followed them for that whole tour. But when the choir came, uh, when Williamson wanted to bring the choir to the East Coast, it was Chris Johnson that used the New York manager and said, you take them. And I was trying to find this, and I couldn't find it today. But there's a note that I have from, Williamson, from Chris Johnson to Williamson saying, with all due respect to him, I'm from New York, so I, I don't mind saying this. Have no fear, friend Williamson. We in the Midwest have a lot to teach the people from the East. And go and sing just as if you're at home and share your heart. And then this will all be good. That concert with Westminster Choir in Pittsburgh is still one of the highlights of my time. If you have not read Don Nally's conversation book with Joe Flummerfeld, get it. It is a wonderful, you see a lot of insights in this man. I would say to you, his music making, I stood in awe, and I still stand in awe of him. 
and the connection to the music being a transformative element of the human being. If the music didn't touch, and this is why I think Andre and I could be there with you today because you have that spirit of Joe's. And when Andre and I were working with the symphonic choir this morning, it, it was so easy because that the technique is there, it has continued to grow, but the, your ethos and your presence, Joe Miller, comes out of the same love for human beings. And he, even though he scared a hell of a lot of us, when that heart opened up, we saw a teddy bear. We saw a wonderful human being who was never about Joe Flummerfeld. It was about how could he be the composer's advocate and find the best in the music and that best to speak to the performers. You mentioned our friend Pearl. And I called her last and I said, I'm doing this. Give me some words I can share. And she writes, words are inadequate to describe what Dr. Flummerfeld means to me. Even as I write this, I'm teary from missing him greatly along with a deep gratitude for what he instilled in me. He was my musical father. Studying with Dr. Flummerfeld is a blessing in my life that I'll always be grateful for. Long after leaving his conducting studio and singing under him as a student, the many lessons about music making, along with his deep sense of humanity, have stayed with me and continue to teach and shape me in my own work. I had the privilege as president of Michigan ACDA and then as president of Central ACDA Division to bring him to pr present and conduct at the state and division conferences. And three years ago, he came to Calvin University to work with my choirs in a week in residency. What a great personal joy for me to host him and watch my own students and singers sing under this choral giant. At his first rehearsal conducting my undergrad concert choir capella in Brahms Liebes Theater, he turned to me with a huge smile. One of many such encouragements over the years that I'll forever cherish. His tire tireless quest for truth and excellence in music making will always be what I continue to aspire and strive for. For me, Joe was this giant. He was human in many ways, as I think you're going to hear from my colleagues. <laughs> but he was a man who changed and touched souls. And he touched mine. And he lives very much in what I do these days. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you, Anton. Thank you very much. We'll come back maybe with some follow-up on that. But uh, Laura, you want to share? I'm happy to. I, um, I can steal from my friend Donald Nally and say that my experience with Joe, I would say, is in three acts. <laughs> <laughs> and that when I first started to teach here in 1985, Joe was on sabbatical, and I heard about this Joseph Flummerfeld. Mind you, I'd come from the operatic world, you know, where pff, choral singing. In fact, I'm quoted in the New York Times saying that when I first got here, I went, pff, Choral singing. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, yeah, it was posted on the bulletin board even. Um, <laughs> so I, I started teaching here, and, and as a, I was 29 years old and, <laughs> and trying to find auditions in New York and trying to figure out how to teach voice <laughs> at the same time. And um, I was in Williamson Hall, and I saw this tall man, handsome man walking up the driveway to Williamson Hall. And I'd never seen a picture of him, and I said, that's somebody important. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that must be Joe Flummerfeld. In my first act, when we were introduced, um, Lindsay Christensen, my good friend, and great teaching mentor, who I miss greatly, um, said, you need to hear this girl. <laughs> and Joe had me come up to his office, like the student, <laughs> to a small <laughs> office and sing Dura Requiem for him, which I did. And that was the first time I saw that twinkle in his eye and the smile of, yeah, OK, let's do some work together. And so we got to do, to collaborate many, many times. And I saw the glare many times when I was singing, but I saw the twinkle in his eye, too, <laughs> when, he, when it was right and when he liked it. Um, Joe was. Um, he, he wove magic in this room. Um, coming out of the operatic training world and then meeting Joe Flummerfeld, meeting Frau Hasemann, meeting Glenn Parker, meeting 
all of these great people who had such an influence on who I am as a musician and certainly who I am as a teacher. Um, it, all I can say is it was magical to witness, you know, Joe prepared for great conductors. And I think that there's, there's got to be, as you said, there's got to be something about their ego that's got to be taken out of that to be able to say, okay, here, Lenny, take over my work. And what I loved watching Leonard Bernstein, watching Ricardo Muti, watching Zubin Mehta, watching Robert Shaw, Rostropovich, all in this room have such reverence for that man and, and, and how the students would see that. I know the alumni who, who were here who were able to experience that um, know what I'm talking about. But what Joe taught me that I, you know, I as a soloist and um, I'd had great opportunities. I, I performed as a soloist with um, Ricardo, not Ricardo Buti, with Meta, with, with great conductors, a lot of times with Robert Shaw and with wonderful artists. But I didn't learn about how to make music till I met Joe Flummerfeld. And um, I fortunately got to have lunch with him about five years ago, right when he was about to retire. And he said, we need, to, we need to get together. So we did, and, um, and I told him that. I said, you know, you are the most important person in my development as to how to look at music and how to go deep in music making and how to collaborate with other people. And um, I credit him, I credit him, I credit Glenn, I credit Lindsay, I credit lots of people whose shoulders I still uh, stand on as I continue to teach professionally. Um, that is kind of act one and act two. Act two is Joe as a colleague where he would call me about a student that he was concerned about in Westminster Choir and um, he's, they're singing flat or the, the sound is fluttering. What are you gonna do about it? And so, and so we'd sit and talk and I'd, I'd tell him, this is what I think we can do about it. And, and what he began, what I, there was a, uh, an element of trust with each other that, you know, he knew that I could help them um, sing in choir and sing as, as a soloist again. So he would, he would consult me a lot. One, one of my students said once, my students here used to call me or still call me LBR instead of Laura Brooks Rice. And one day he said, well, go ask LBJ. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there are a lot of stories like that. Um, but uh, the care that he took with, and how he knew every single student in symphonic choir, and he knew their sound, he knew uh, who they were, he cared about each one of them, and you know would, would collaborate with his colleagues for the betterment of the student, which I always appreciated. Um, Joe is a friend. Joe is a dear friend. Um, when he would come back after he retired, we'd have this look <laughs> that, and I just felt centered. I felt, okay, I can keep going. I can keep going with my work. We just had this look that we could have, that twinkle in his eye, and that bear hug of always being glad to see me. Um, Joe as friend, uh, we were scheduled to, I was scheduled to sing a Mozart Requiem with him in my parents' hometown where I now live in Sewanee, Tennessee, where they have a music festival every summer. And unbeknownst to either of us did I know that my mother would contract pancreatic cancer. So the Mozart Requiem was scheduled. I was scheduled to sing. My mother passed away on a Saturday. Her funeral was Wednesday. The Mozart Requiem was Saturday. Mm -hmm. Joe came to my mother's funeral. Um, I sang the Mozart Requiem in her memory, <laughs> which was not easy, but that twinkle in his eye got me through it. And that friend got me through it. And then he and my father bonded over a really good scotch <laughs> <laughs> afterwards. So, um, um, 
I, I, I don't think I'll ever meet another person like that, that, that his, um, the, the true art, the true collaborator of how to pull a group together, how to pull a quartet together, how to pull people together and be on the same page, not his opinion necessarily, but be on the same page musically and make magic together. Um, the ghosts in this room are so <laughs> prevalent for me right now. All the people that are, Joe primarily, but the other people, Frauka, Laura, wow! <laughs> <laughs> I have a funny Frauka story, then I'll pass it on. Frauka Hausman uh, was going to go to New Mexico to do a workshop. And she says, Laura, I don't understand this. Was ist Albuquerque? <laughs> I said, it's Albuquerque. <laughs> oh, that's great. Was? <laughs> Quebec, Albuquerque. <laughs> So, one other, one other time, I was uh, the chief, the marshal, to bring the graduating class in twice. The last time I was in the rehearsal, in come the red robes, and they, because I, I was always so nervous about getting them up in there, and oh, it's gotta be perfect, so I had to follow Alan Kroll's, Alan, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, the graduating class didn't come in, and Joe was yelling every expletive in the chapel. <laughs> I finally said, you know, I, I didn't, we weren't that close then. I said, Joe, just be quiet. This is a rehearsal. But I, I wasn't the chief marshal after that. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, he was my dear friend, and I miss him, and I credit him for being an inspiration as I continue to teach and help young people learn how to listen and learn how to collaborate and, not, and it not be all about them. So thank you. Thank you. You know, Heather, <laughs> Heather, please share with us. Well, I wrote something down because I didn't trust myself to lose it, but here we go. Um, and I have to say from the get-go that um, when your email came a couple of weeks ago, I was really humbled and quite overwhelmed. Uh, Anton and I have known each other for about 20 years. No, Actually, probably through other that. people, we've known each other longer than that. But he was one of the only people I knew in America when I came here. Um, the other person was Marvin Kinsey, mm. who I knew before I came. Um, I had lessons with Laura, and she, I, I probably need to tell everybody what you taught me <laughs> that I took into Westminster Choir. Laura taught me the value of singing with my real voice. Um, because like so many young singers, you feel this pull between your solo existence and what you need to do in the choir. And, you know, if somebody like Joe is telling somebody to shush, I was the one that shushed four times more than I should have <laughs> because of whatever. In any case, I would have a lesson with her and then she'd say, right, now you take that voice and you go and use that voice in that choir. So I'd march in here and I'd sit there and get all brave. And so I have to give you the credit for that because today I teach that you use the voice that God or your studio teacher is giving <laughs> And sometimes they're the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and in your case, yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so to be on this panel with these people and to be in this space, it's 23 years since I made the, um, the decision to come here and it was done in fact um, on the basis of the folk songs recording. Mm. Uh, because I listened to that sound and one day a, an older man in the Rotary Club said to me, if you had your dream, what would it be? And I said, oh, that's so easy. I said, there's this place called Westminster Choir College and everybody thought that was in England, of course, because when you say <laughs> Westminster, that's what they think. And he said, and why would you want to go there? And I said, well, I said, there's this choir there. It's the Westminster Choir and they have this conductor and they get to do this thing that the rest of us just dream about, but they do it there every day. And, and I played this recording for him. He was an amateur musician himself. And I said, it was, it was actually black is the color of my okay, true love's yeah, hair. It's the yeah. first one. The Churchill, on yeah. The Churchill. Yeah. And, um, and then the Danny Boy, of course. But I just said, 
anybody that can get a choir to sound like this and make music like this, I said, I really, I need to sing for this man and I need to study with him and I need to know his secrets. And he said, oh, well, that's a great dream to have. Well, little did I realize several years later, I won a Rotary Foundation mm. ambassadorial scholarship, which in those days was worth $24,500. Mm. And our friend Knut Christensen, Lindsay's <laughs> husband, who is sitting here, was um, the president of the Rotary Club here in Princeton, and they were my host club. And so I actually knew Knut before I knew many of you. And uh, so he was part of my extended Rotary family that helped me get here. Um, and, it, and it was all because of the sound of this music. Um, and of course, I'd heard stories about the man, but to hear that sound and just to know that you connected so viscerally on some level, I, I, I just, I left my job, I left my family. I convinced, it, I convinced my husband of five years to sell everything and come with me. And we arrived here and my parents said, um, she sounds really happy. Is it really as good as she says it is? And Peter said, hard to explain it, Jan. He said, she just looks normal here. <laughs> and <laughs> because in, in my family and in my world, you know, I was sort of the, the crazy choral musician and I think some of you understand what I mean. When you come to this place, you have found your people. You have mm. found your tribe. Mm. So, I've known, I knew Joe for two thirds of my professional life. Um, I came here just for two years. My school back in Australia held my job. I was absolutely convinced that's where I was going. In fact, I only had a one way ticket to go back. I used one half of it to get here and I had to save the other half to go back. When I graduated, I literally had $7 in my wallet and, and had borrowed money to buy the dress and pay for the programs and pay for the organist for my graduate conducting recital. Um, he convinced me to stay here to work, and that is another story. Alan Kroll was part of that as well. Um, but so I did. I sang in the Westminster Choir, which was, of course, my great love. The Westminster Symphonic Choir, the first thing we sang with the New York Philharmonic was the Britain War Requiem. And I took that under Mazur. And I took that as an amazing omen because the first symphonic work I ever sang as an undergraduate was the Britain War Requiem. Um, and in fact, that first semester, the one thing that felt real to me was the music because, you know, a crotchet equals. <laughs> and everybody here talked about quarter notes and half notes and eighth notes, and I had to translate all of that. Um, it, was, it was just, yeah, it was, it was sort of interesting how these, these things sort of pop up. Um, I also sang in the New York Choral Artists with him on occasion, so I can truly say Joe was my teacher. He became a colleague and a mentor. Um, and, and then a friend. And I remember one day he looked at me and he said, you know, you really should call me Joe. <laughs> so, and I, now my students, you know, they want to call me Dr. Buchanan. And I'm like, you've graduated, you can call me Heather. And they're like, no. <laughs> I know what that's like. Um, I have to mention Nancy Ann Perella as well. In fact, mm -hmm. I bought props. My students uh, gave me this photograph of Nancy and Joe and I um, when Joe passed away. And at the time, they didn't know who Nancy was, and they said to my accompanist, Stephen Ryan, should we cut the lady out? And he's like, no, 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 the lady's an important part of what's going on in this picture. So this is a Westminster Choir tour. Probably, I would say, about, probably about 20, probably about 20, 18, 20 years ago, and it's myself and Joe and Nancy on an uh, escalator doing the thing. So if any of you want to come and have a look at that, you can. It's just, it's classic Joe posture, actually, when you see that picture. It it's looks perfect. It mm -hmm. is perfect. It, and so, in any case, um, I used to call Nancy Ann my American mother because anybody who knew Nancy Ann Perella just knew. I mean, she mm -hmm. took me under her wing. Um, and it was funny because Joe had a lot of characteristics very similar to my father. Um, they both could have this quick temper at times and yet be quite shy and quite docile at others. It was just interesting. And just another side note, my mother and Nancy Ann both died of an aortic aneurysm 
and my father and Joe both died of a brain cancer, <laughs> and within the st uh, three years of each other. So th there was just some weird parallels there. In any case, um, it, it, he would sometimes say when it was uh, coming up to a birthday or something was happening, I'd say, what would you like to do? And he'd say, let's just have family dinner. So family dinner meant Nancy Ann and Joe Perella, which automatically meant Joe Perella was cooking. <laughs> and, um, and we'd go to 13 Slayback Drive, uh, Princeton Junction, and there'd be my husband, me, Joe, Nancy, and her Joe. And we would just sit around and talk, and he would have scotch, of course. And we, this is how we would celebrate all sorts of things, birthdays, after concerts. Um, so many special memories of that. As a, as a graduate student, however, I drew the lottery. I met him um, in person very quickly after I arrived. In fact, I was appalled because I'd come 10,000 miles to audition and sing for this man, only to be told that the auditions were closed. He'd already auditioned the Westminster Choir. You would have to wait a full year for the next round of auditions. And I went into Alan Kroll's office and I said, but that's just not fair. And, and I said, let me sing for you. So I sang for Alan and he looked at me and said, no, 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 your voice is too big. And I was like, what? This is ridiculous, you know. Anyway, what I didn't know was behind the scenes, a soprano two in the Westminster Choir had decided to drop out at the last minute, quite unexpectedly. <laughs> <laughs> and I happened to be singing in Paul Head's graduate conducting recital. We were doing many things that I love, including the Stanford motets. So Joe had been at all these rehearsals and he'd seen this blonde curly head thing in the choir. Anyway, the long story short is I was called to his office to audition and in short time found myself in the middle of Frieda Alf Eden. They'd learned the first <laughs> half and there I was sight reading Schoenberg and uh, it was all good. So I got my dream, I got my wish to be in the Westminster Choir. Um, but Joe liked... He just liked me for some reason. And he would invite me to his office Friday afternoons. So we'd finish Master Singers, and then there'd be a break before Westminster Choir rehearsal. In those days, it was at 4 o'clock. So at 3 o'clock, I would find myself in his office, and he had the two chairs, and his office was the colours of Christmas, <laughs> maroon and green. And he'd sit in his chair, and I would sit in the other chair, and we would talk. And sometimes he would ask me questions about things, but most often it was about Joe talking and asking questions about teaching and pedagogy and life. And then he would tell me stories about Lenny and Sam, and this was, of course, Leonard Bernstein and Sam Barber, who, of course, were people who were names in textbooks or on album co covers that I had revered. And so uh, to say that I was starstruck was an understatement, but... But we, we had this, this connection and this friendship, and I think possibly because I was a little bit older than the undergraduates in the choir, but there always was this personal connection that we had had right from the get-go, and that was always very special. I think my favourite time of the year was Spoleto Festival USA, um, not the least of which because Charleston, South Carolina feels a lot like Brisbane, Australia, where I'm from. <laughs> the climate, you get off the plane, you smell the air and the hair just goes up <laughs> because there's humidity and curly hair needs humidity, I'm just saying. Um, and the accent, of course, is different, um, but uh, Southern people are just so gracious and, of course, we were in the Westminster Choir, so we were the next best thing to celebrities. And when you add that with an Australian accent, you were guaranteed free meals and lots of good Southern hospitality, which I enjoyed many times. Um, professionally, I have to say that Joe has been the single greatest influence on my career and my development. I think the lesson that I learned from him most importantly, was the value of being a lifelong student. And he absolutely modelled this. And I'm going to tell you a story um, that still to this day I tell my students and it still amazes me. Um, so apart from the fact that whenever we're on Westminster Choir tours or even doing a run out into the city, Joe would be sitting there with his score on his lap. And it, it, it would be something that he'd know incredibly well, but he'd be there studying, and if noise got too much on the bus, he would ban us from speaking. And then we all had to study scores, etc. And I'm sitting there, one time it was a Copeland Festival, I'm thinking, 
what the hell does he see and I bought me a cat? <laughs> like, you know, but there he was. He was always looking for something, right? <clears throat> so there was one time when we got this bequest and the choir college got money for Joe to put on a concert of his choosing. So they hired Richardson Auditorium, they contracted an orchestra, and he got to choose the work. So guess what he chose? You know, Brahms' German Requiem. Because, and it took me many years actually to conduct Brahms without feeling utterly paranoid, <laughs> because I just never quite thought that I could live up to his, his standards. In any case, he conducts this German Requiem, and, and it was extraordinary. And it was all the more extraordinary because, as Laura just mentioned before, <coughs> preparing your choir to then give them over to other conductors re requires somebody with a servant spirit and a very, very special capacity. Um, you know what that's like. I mean, sometimes it's difficult when you're handing them over to someone that you're thinking, really? But Joe, Joe always knew. He always knew and he was trusted and, and so for him to be able to conduct the orchestra and the choir on the German Requiem was a particular treat. So the concert goes on and I was standing slightly off the stage so that when he came off the stage at the end I was the first person there to, to get him what he needed. And he had this look in his eyes these blue eyes, and he came off and it was this, he just looked at me and he said, I think that's how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> and for a split second, I'm thinking, are you shitting me? <laughs> and then all of it, I didn't say anything, of course, that's, in, that's the ticker tape in my mind, right? And then I stopped and went, oh my God, he means it. And in that moment, I felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders because at that time, I was the fifth of five conductors on this campus. And there wasn't a day that didn't go by that I'm walking across the quad to the chapel to conduct a scholar rehearsal and I'm not thinking about, is it good enough, is it this, is it that, is it... I mean, you're under a microscope um, at the best of times. And I was just obsessed with you know, everything having to be this, that, and the other. And in that moment, all the times that he had said that you're still learning and you have to go deeper and it's okay to be this, and in that moment, I realized, but wait, there's more. So that night, we had dinner at Nancy and Joe's after the <laughs> concert. It took him two hours to believe us that it was a great concert, that it was okay. He kept, he kept rehashing moments, but, but what about that? It was just, this is the way he was. And I can remember other concerts where something had been phenomenal and for a week after he'd be still chewing or ruminating over something and he just needed to process it and he needed to talk about it. So I think that's how it goes. I thought, man, if you can say that with all of your gifts and all of your experience, then I'm done or going to give myself permission to grow and to learn. And more than that, I'm going to make sure that I give all of my students the same permission. The other really special thing that he did for me, so when I was here, I had the great fortune to encounter Barbara Conable. And in fact, Lindsay Christensen was in the first class that I took with Barbara Conable. And we were doing a Saturday seminar with Barbara and I had been, I've always been interested in bodies and how they work and I'd done a little Alexander work before I came to the States, but I had some fairly specific reasons for wanting to go and see what this woman was talking about. So I decided I wasn't gonna tell anybody what I was doing, I was just gonna do it and see if it made a difference. So after a while, Joe comes up to me one day and he says, what are you doing that's different? I looked at him, he bailed me up right outside the front of the playhouse here. And he said, something's different. You're doing something different. I want to know what you're doing that's different. And I sort of looked at him, and I'm like, whatever you do mean? Anyway, long story short is he, he heard a difference in the sound. He saw a difference in me. He, he was, there's something was up. What were you doing that was different? So I 
told him I was talking about it. Well, he was, he was very interested, so much so that all of a sudden, instant invitation to the graduate conducting class to do this, and then he started making a list. Can you fix this? Can you fix that? Can you talk to... Like, it doesn't quite work like that, Joe, but anyway. <laughs> but the point was he, he really believed in this work, and he supported me. In fact, he sat in my trial course as part of the qualifications for that. You have to be able to deliver a course and do whatever, and there he was in the front row being a student in my body mapping class. Um, which was just really um, amazing and is still something I'm doing and loving. I think the thing that first captured my imagination with him as a student was the way he would get his hands on the sound. And uh, we've all experienced that. Um, even just over a year ago, he came to Montclair to do some work with my choir on the Mozart Requiem. And I remember my grad assistant turning around and looking at me and she'd saying, I don't know what it is about him, but I just love him. Um, and, and as I was warming the choir up that night for him, I was on the podium and we were getting ready to go and he was sitting right there. And at one point I caught his gaze and he was just sitting there staring at me, looking at me with those blue eyes. And I had this flashback to a conducting class a long time ago when I was feeling particularly... <laughs> And I took a breath and I said, stop it, stop it. Just take a breath, just do what you do. And later on I found out that it was actually the look of adoration and wow, that's your sound. <laughs> and he said to me that night over dinner, you know, I just had a lot of fun with your kids tonight. He said, I didn't do anything differently with them than I would have done with the Westminster Choir. And that was the you're all right. <laughs> and it, that was a huge, huge compliment because the students that I work with are certainly, many of them first generation to come to college and many of them are little diamonds in the rough. So there was no expectation on my part that he would feel that way about working with them. But he got some amazing sounds out of them and to be perfectly honest, for me, that Mozart Requiem, the highlight for my students, was their time with Joe. The time with the orchestra was lovely, but the time with Joe was more special. Joe absolutely practiced what he preached from the podium. Vulnerability, listening, trusting not just yourself, but trusting your singers. His capacity to be in the moment. There was always a raw, visceral intensity in his being that was both beguiling, sometimes terrifying, and always compelling. Joe was always driven by this need to, to show the human impulse that was underlying the musical moment. There was no artifice, and he always expected us to be his partners in that artistic journey. It was never about do what I want, it was always about be with me and, and understand the integrity that the composer is striving for. I remember one day, and we were sitting this way, of course, because he was on the piano and I too was appalled <laughs> when I first came here. In fact, the piano tuner, I mean, he used to sometimes get up such a, a, a thing that the piano would start to move and Nancy Ann was bracing herself <laughs> against the keyboard. <laughs> One day, in an absolute fit of frustration with the Westminster Choir, there was a wrong note somewhere, and I don't remember the piece, but he just screamed at us. He said, how can you do that? It's like a spitball on the Mona Lisa. <laughs> and he just sat there, and he just looked at people, and everybody was like, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> so this season, we had actually organized He'd been wanting to come and do a residency and we kept putting it off and putting it off. And anyway, he decided he wanted to come in the spring. So we decided this, this season would be the season he was going to come and do the 4A Requiem yeah. with organ and chamber orchestra. And Nancy Ann was going to come and play <laughs> the organ. So we were going to have this lovely get together. I'd prepare them for him and I would conduct my um, university singers on the other half of the program. We had this whole plan. Of course, then when Joe passed, Nancy Ann said, I'll still come, we'll still do it. 
And then when Nancy Ann passed, I was in Europe, actually had just finished performing the 4A Mass Bass um, at, Me uh, at Melk Abbey. And Nancy Ann was actually the person who'd suggested that that would be a good piece to do for that space. Mm -hmm. So we're still going to, going to give the concert. Um, one of our alums from here will be the organist. And we're going to entitle it Legacy. Um, and the program will be a tribute to both Nancy Ann and Joe. Only a very small number, of course, of my students have actually met either of them directly. But I need them to know that they too are beneficiaries of his profound musical legacy for all of us who had the good fortune and the honour and the privilege to be his students. Our students need to know that his legacy lives on through us. There isn't a day that doesn't go by that I'm on the podium that I don't think. Breathe and listen. To really listen to what you have to say. To what the music needs to say. And he taught me to do that. Because of him, I have the courage to do what I do today. And that is a tremendous honor. And I really didn't want to cry. You're okay. It's your fault. You cried first. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. We have uh, one more contributor to our uh, panel tonight. I consider myself so lucky to have been able to work with Dr. Flammerfeld, with Joe. Um, I think the circumstances were really, um, you know, how life is sometimes where it's meant to be. I became aware of the Westminster Choir College through my choral conductor in Montreal, who just told me when I was 16 that I needed to go to the United States and try to, you know, have some workshops with great knowledgeable people and this was the place to go in the summer. So I went when I was 16, I went again when I was 18. I had the great fortune to work with Andrew Miguel in, uh, when I was 16 and that was really wonderful uh, memories. But then, two years later, got the chance also to work with uh, Dr. Flammerfeld. I was an avid co uh, collector of uh, CDs at the time, you know? Remember those, you know, not the records, but the metal ones? You know, I know that the younger generation still doesn't know what this is. <laughs> um, and all the choral recordings I had with the New York Philharmonic, with the Philadelphia Orchestra, and also a cappella, I had a lot prepared by Joe Flammerfeld and I understood why when I came here um, in Princeton and understood that all was about the breathing, the sound, there was something about the poise and the posture and the intensity of the contact with the eyes, um, which in many ways has been the single most inspiring moment in my training as a conductor. Of course, I then followed the, in the footsteps of Carlo Maria Giulini in Italy and elsewhere in Europe, and I had other training moments, but this, I believe, these two summers, and especially the one with Joe Flammerfeld, was absolutely determining in the musician I am today. And as I'm now, as you can see in my dressing room at the Met, uh, every day I think about uh, his vision of music and also his encouragement because uh, he also, I asked him to sign my score and he sang something that uh, about, I can't remember exactly, but something like, you're gonna have a great future ahead of you or something like this. And I remember thinking, oh, that's so nice, but I didn't quite believe it. But now every day I'm grateful that I'm able to work with the best musicians um, and singers uh, in the world. So thanks to Joe Flammerfeld.
Well, I want to thank you all very much for coming and sharing. Um, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg of, of our stories and, and the legacy um, that he had. Uh, and uh, we, have, uh, we have refreshments, and I hope that you will stay around and we'll continue to swap stories uh, and celebrate this incredible human being. So, panel, thank you all very much for being here. Appreciate it. symposium is tomorrow. Please come. If you're not registered, come and, and share in these two incredible human beings here that are going to be with us all day tomorrow. Thank you all very much. Oh, so good.